And aren't we excited that there's only a few shopping days left for Christmas? <laughs> well, I already told my kids there is a uh, you know delivery shortage, so uh, Santa is probably going to have to stay at the North Pole this year because he can't get into ports. Amen. All the All right. Well, we've been going through the way, truth, and life. Famous words uttered by Jesus in John chapter 14 when he told his disciples, I'm going where you can't go. You can't go with me now, but he said there's coming a time when you're going to come. And you'll be with me where I am. And Thomas, the daddy Thomas, said, Jesus, if we don't know where you're going, how are we going to get there? And Jesus said, you know the way. Because I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. You know, this book we've been going through, it's all about grace. And grace is... It's just a single word, but it encompasses so much of the life of, of faith and the life of discipleship of following Christ. And we talked about grace. It's, it's, it's a grace that goes before us. It's prevenient. It's the grace before. It tracks us down. It, tracks, it looks after. It follows us. It's like a bloodhound. I was watching Mythbusters the other day, and they were, they were checking this idea of a bloodhound, and they were seeing, can, a, can you out? Run, can you get away? Can you fool a bloodhound and escape him from being able to find you? It was funny, I, I tuned in towards the end of it, and the last thing that they had done was they wrapped Jamie Ackerman in two different suits and they 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 like put a mask, and I mean he must have been sweltering. I mean, no physical scent for his body was outside of him at all. And then he took a uh, a water jug and he sprayed some of his scent in all these other areas to distract the dog and then he went and he hid somewhere and in less than five minutes that scent that dog picked up, followed all those tracks but found right where he's at. And he said, you just can't get away from a hound dog. And you know, the Holy Spirit is known, is described as the hound of heaven. What does that mean? That means he's got your scent. Look at your neighbor and say, the Spirit smells you. Go ahead, tell them right now. The Spirit smells you. You, you, your neighbor, smell you right now, too. If you forgot to use your right guard, you know. Are you sure? Okay. But God has the scent of his children, and he is relentless. Long before Arnold Schwarzenegger played the role of the Terminator, somebody beat him to those famous words. I'll be back. Jesus, before he ascended, I'll be back. And he's come back in a powerful way. He came back and sent a spirit to us in the upper room. The disciples experienced that. And that provenient grace turned into saving grace. That grace saved them. And it came in the sound of a mighty rushing wind. And, and there was tongues like fire that rested on the disciples. And suddenly they were, they were filled with power. And they were filled with boldness. And they were filled with this ability to begin to speak the truth the gospel of Jesus Christ and the more even incredible thing that happened was all the people there that had heard these stories that had heard the message that knew about Moses and they knew about Noah before Moses and they knew about Abraham they knew all of the ancestors they knew the story of God's creating of the world Adam and Eve's sin and God's story of redemption they knew all the stories but for the first time they understood at Pentecost when the spirit came and that saving grace was made available and was applied to the lives of those who would receive it. So grace is prevenient. Grace tracks us down. Grace saves us when it finds us and it gets a hold of us and we finally surrender to it and I give up. That grace saves us. And last week and today we're talking about this sanctifying grace. What does it do once it saves us? Is that the end game? Is that the goal? Is it my job to get all of you to feel really guilty about all the bad things you do, get you to come to an altar and say, okay, Jesus, I give up, you found me, and then you go home and that's it? Or is it something more than that? Now this chapter, if you read chapter 4, there's a lot of meat on the bones in chapter 4 because sanctifying grace is a powerful thing. And Thessalonians, Paul tells us, it's the will of God that you would be sanctified. And Jesus told us in John chapter 17, he says, the Father, he prayed for us, prayed for his disciples and prayed for all those who would believe on him because of those disciples. And he prayed that God would sanctify us by his truth. You are truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify us. Break that word down a little bit. What does it mean? This idea of sanctify means to be set apart. It means to be identified as, as purely belonging 
to one. It's this, this, this idea of consecration, this commitment of other commitment to something bigger than ourselves. Now I think of it this way, and I, I kind of try to, to use it this way. Yesterday, we were, was that yesterday? Oh my gosh, I lost track of the week. Yesterday in here about 11, really 11.15, 11, we, we had some people walking up this aisle, and we had a wedding right here. And think about this idea of this wedding when Sandy was here and Star was here and, and they did the betrothal and then they came forward and they sat up there and I, I did their vows and I take you, you know, I Sandy take you, Star, I Star take you, Sandy. And they got married, they committed themselves. Think of that as this idea of sanctification. Because in the act of marriage, what are you saying to the person who's standing in front of you? You're saying, I'm committing everything I am to you. To you alone, nobody else, nothing else. We're in this together, utterly together. The scripture says, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and the two will become one, one flesh. And so sanctification is this idea that the Holy Spirit comes to us, and the Holy Spirit finds us, and the Holy Spirit says, my grace is sufficient, it covers all of your sins. That's sort of the, do you want to get married, right? Isn't that, isn't that what it is? I mean, when you ask somebody to marry you, I mean, it's not like, I mean, it's officially that you want to marry him, right? But the deal isn't done, right? There's something that's still coming. There's this crisis moment because, you know, I'm sure there's YouTube videos of it where people ask have this big setup and they ask somebody to marry them and they're waiting for that big yes and they get a big fat. Well, it's going to be pretty hard to continue that relationship, isn't it? Really hard. And so there's, there's this idea that God saves us and he, and he says, all right, I've, I've covered, I've done everything. I bought the ring. I got the date. I got, I got the place. I got the preacher. Everything's ready. All I'm going to do is stand up and say I do. But that's a whole new moment, right? Because in the engagement, you're setting up the wedding. You're inviting the list. Who's in? Who's out? What's for dessert? What's for food? Where's the venue? Who's the DJ? You're, but... But that's all preliminary because this big day is coming where you're going to stand up here in front of your friends and family and in front of God and there's going to be a pastor there and he's going to say, do you take? Do you say I do? And that's a whole different thing. And that's sort of this idea. God saves us, but he says, all right, I saved you. And God says, you have all that I am. But in this idea of sanctification, it's this sort of idea of of God saying, I want all of you. You got all of me. I sent my son. I tracked you down. You asked me to forgive you. I did by the grace of my son's sacrifice. I've got all of that. You've got everything I have. You've got it all. But now I need the rest of you. Fully created, fully consecrated, fully committed to give yourself fully to me. And that, in a nutshell, is sort of this idea of sanctified grace. Why is that important? How many of you have been inside a garage in your lifetime? Have you stood? Amen. Not girl, yes. How many of you here today are convinced that you are a car? <laughs> right? You've heard it said. Standing in a garage does not make you a car. And sitting in a church does not make you doesn't make you a follower of God. Doesn't make you one with your heavenly Father. It's a good place to be. You're going to hear a lot about that idea and that thought, but but just like standing in a church in the middle of a wedding doesn't make you married to the person up here. Because there are a lot of people standing around when I was here in the middle of I'm in the middle of these two are committing to each other. Guess what? All of those people weren't suddenly married to these people. It was the two that were there that had to look each other in the eye and say, you have all of me from here on out. Completely. And so sitting in a church doesn't make you one, but coming to the Father and accepting His gift of grace. And then when He says to you, psst, psst, I need this. I need that. I need that anger. I need those regrets. I need those grudges. 
I need those talents. I need your time. I need your finances. I need your spouse. I need your kids. I need all that you are. And he keeps whispering in it, thing after thing after thing, and a moment after moment, and it leads us up to this moment, this huge idea moment. You're like, what do you want? Everything? And he says, yes. Amen. Yes. That's his idea of sanctification. Now, I'm not going to get into the theological weeds, and there are those absolute followers of Jesus Christ who, who disagree, and, and they kind of have this idea that once you're a sinner, you're always a sinner, and sin will always be present, and, and you don't really have to change things, and you just give to an altar, and you say a prayer, and you do what I do, and, and then you go off, and you go, and you live your life, and when you die, you get to go to heaven. Now, I've married a lot of people. I've done a lot of weddings. And I always liken it to like this. So, I remarried Wayne and Sarah. So, he's on the front row. You don't have to. He's on the front row. You're saved today. But Wayne's over here, so I'm going to pick up Wayne. And so, we remarried them. But here's the idea. If I married Wayne and Sarah, and Wayne says, you know what, Sarah? I got a call for a job on the West Coast. It's going to be awesome. So I'm going to take off, I'm going to go over there, and you stay here with the kids, and you stay here with the chickens, and you stay here with the house, and the greenhouse, and you stay here with all the projects that didn't get done. I'm going to go on the West Coast, and man, am I going to have a great time. I'm going to make a lot of money, and, and when I have time, I'll send you money, and when i got time, I'll come back Christmas and Easter for sure. Isn't it great to be married, honey? Boom, see you later. Wayne, Wayne seems to be anticipating this possibility. <laughs> so, let me ask you a non rhetorical question. Would Wayne and Sarah be married? Yes. Not for long. <laughs> Not for long. <laughs> oh, you're oh, you getting it. They would be technically married, but guess what they wouldn't have? A marriage. Because a marriage is impossible without a relationship, and a relationship is impossible worlds apart. Times of separation, yeah, but if you're in this thing together, you're in this thing together. And you see, some people think that there's this idea that God chased me down, God found me, God saved me, and now He's going to leave me alone until I die. And just the moment I die, he's going to show up just in time to take me to heaven. <clears throat> and God said, whoa, 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 whoa. that isn't what I want. And you know, I know every person who's ever accepted the grace of Christ and been saved faces this moment when God's saying, do I have all of you? Because I've seen it again and again. I see people get to that get to that edge, and they, they're looking in, and they're like, man, God, that's a long, are you sure you want me to jump in? Are you, are you sure? And I've seen people come as close as an altar like this, and God's saying, I need it all. I need all of you. And, and they do something which I've never seen it done, but if yesterday, Santi, I'm going to start our ears off. I'll pick on him. If Sandy had looked at him, he was actually nervous. He was a little kid. He said, man, am I supposed to feel nervous? I said, well, you're about to get married for the rest of your life. Do that to us part until she kills you. So, yeah, I mean, it's a little natural. <laughs> but imagine that they had been here, and I said, Santy, would you repeat after me? And he said, whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on. You know what? Hmm. I'm kind of feeling it, but I ain't kind of today feeling it. Tell you what. Let's put a pin in that, all right? Let's put a pin in it. It's not going away. Let's give me, give me a few months. Give me about three more months. I'll work up to this. We'll come back. We'll get the, the, the dress, and I'll wear my suit, and get, we'll come back. Pastor Jim, we'll get it on the counter. We'll just, let's put a pin in it. Let's come back to it. Now, the ladies in the room, all the ladies, all the single ladies, are, are you going to come back? To that little pin. Don't tell me. <laughs> Depends on how much money he's got. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's going to be a good relationship. <laughs> the reality is, if you get that, if you're right there, 
everything you gotta do and you back out. Relationship isn't ended, but it's kind of over. Because now there's this huge, huge void in prospect in there. And you said this sanctifying grace is it's the same thing when you get this close. You say, hey God, hey Dad, hey Jesus, let's, let's put a pin in there. You got a couple other things. Okay? Just, I'm almost just. Now God doesn't go anywhere. But we start to go somewhere. Because the moment you begin to back out of it, now I don't want to make you think that this is cataclysmic and you can't come back from this. You can't. But every time that you resist that I do, the next one, the next moment, the next next ceremony, it's harder to get up there. And God's grace is always available to all of us. Provenient grace, saving grace, and his sanctifying grace. It is always available to us. But as we begin to harden our hearts toward it, it's harder for us, not God, it's harder for us to give in to it to receive it, to accept it, because we're building that callous in our hearts and our lives against it. It's a little bit like working on the cross-cut ground crew. <laughs> the first day of throwing branches in that wicked chipper and running rakes. Cut for show, rake for dough. Right? It's got to look good for us. <coughs> But the first day, no gloves, man, the calluses. You didn't know you had so many soft spots on your hands. Nick's shaking his head, oh yeah, oh yeah. But after a while, you begin to get tougher and tougher and your calluses begin to grow and it doesn't hurt so much. And you begin to not feel what you felt the first few times. The same thing is true with the Spirit of God's voice. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. And eventually it's, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Well, Holy Spirit, you can come, but leave me alone. Eventually, you just begin to forget to invite the Holy Spirit at all. And that's why sanctifying grace is so important. Because it's not something to be done in you. It's not something to be fixed. It's not this thing. It's a relationship. It's an intimate, deep, abiding, personal relationship. That's what God desires. That's what God wants. And that's what sanctifying grace is. I gotta go over here and get my phone because I don't know what time it is. And I don't know what to send you guys home to eat some spaghetti. Alright, now I did promise I did a video, and even though Will didn't, didn't watch it, he knows what it was about. And it was, do you have questions? And I'm gonna give you a chance if you have questions. And you know, I will try my best to fill the rest of my time. If I have to, it's hard for me to speak in public, you know. Sometimes it is. But uh, before you ask any questions, I wanted to give you a quote from the book that I reread the entire chapter again this week. And on page 90, in the middle, he's talking about where uh, Paul talks about becoming like Jesus and about being, he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And I like this quote. He says, the question is not if you are going to be spiritually formed. The question is, what will form you? Because I got news for you. If you're not willing to allow the Spirit of God, that sanctifying grace, to form you, to transform you, to renew your minds, it doesn't mean that you're not still being conformed. Oh, you'll be conformed. You'll be conformed by your job. You'll be conformed by your spouse. You'll be conformed by your kids. You'll be conformed by your boss. You'll be conformed by your friends. You'll be conformed by your habits. You'll be conformed by your hobbies. You'll be conformed by everything that is taking up every moment of your life. It's not a question of will you be conformed. The question is what is conforming, what is forming, what is transforming who you are and what your life is about. And that's what this idea of sanctifying grace is. It's saying, God, it's an amazing thing to me. It's an amazing thing. 
to say God transformed me because here's the deal. He won't without your permission. He gave you the breath of life. He gave you your mind and your talents and your spouse and your kids and your all the life you have. If it weren't for God, it wouldn't be possible. And yet still, he won't step on your ability to say no. So he will transform you, but only as you say, I do. Yes, I do. So before I give you some other thoughts, is there anybody who has a question? Anything in this chapter, anything in your mind that's just been raised, you say, I just want to ask a question. And there's, as the old saying goes, there's no dumb question except the one you don't ask. That's your chance. This is like serving in this act for, for the adults. Bring something up, surprise me. We'll see if we get there. I love surprises. I'm not going to do this like that auction where if you move or you blink or you make eye contact, I call it. <laughs> there are some scriptures um, that I want to read for you. And if you have your Bible or have Cody come pull, we're going to jump over to the book of Romans real quick. The Romans chapter 7. I'm going to read down through some of this, Cody. I'm just going to see where I want to go with this. Um, Paul talks about this idea of who we are before sanctified grace. And Paul, verse 21 of chapter 7, says this. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Now don't look at your neighbor right now when you say evil is right there with me, okay? Don't look at your kids and your spouse. He says, For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am, who will save me? Who will save me and rescue me from this body of death and sin? sin. And if you go up there further, Paul says, the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I say, I'm never going to do that again. I go back and do it. And Paul says, there's this war within me. Now, we had an opportunity to go do a mission project to the Navajo Nation, and, and it's an old story. The Navajo, one of the guys there told me, he said there's this, this story that the, the medicine man will tell. He says about the two dogs. There was a white dog and a black dog, and these dogs would war against each other. And it was this same idea, this age-old concept that wanting to do one thing, the right thing, but the, the, the power and the force that makes us do the wrong thing seems to come fight and battle within us. And he said, there's this constant war between these two dogs in my soul and my spirit. And they're constantly waiting for me to get to do the right thing or to do the wrong thing. And this battle is an epic struggle that goes on in my life. And that's kind of what Paul's talking about. And as I was told the story when we're out there at the, at the Navajo Nation at Dilcon, Arizona, the, the question was asked, well, which dog wins? You probably heard the story. He said, it all depends. Depends on what? Which dog I feed. I thought that was a pretty good little lesson, a little good understanding, because you see this battle against us in our hearts and our minds. <laughs> do what's right, do what's wrong. Paul says, it really depends on what you feed. Moving over to Romans chapter 8, he says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law, what I want to do, was powerless to do, doing the right thing, was powerless to do because it, has, it was weakened by the flesh. I can't resist it. He said, God did by sending his Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to become a sin offering and so condemn sin in the flesh that in order the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And that's this idea of sanctification, or entire sanctification, or as John Wesley put it, and I really like this definition, perfected in love. Is there anybody here who loves somebody? Boy, some lonely people in this place. Stephen, I'm going to pray that God can just bring that right. Just 
We all know how to love. But perfected in love, wow, that's a whole new level, isn't it? You know, one of the things I love about doing premarital counseling, I just love it. Because I always say, do you love each other unconditionally? You can tell you probably remember that question, right? And what did you guys say to that question? Yeah! yeah! I said, great! So if you get married, and a week later, Nick goes out and has an affair with some woman, Taylor, you're still going to love him! Well, <laughs> hold on! That would be a problem. To which I say, oh, you mean that's like a, 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 a condition? Yeah. This idea of perfected in love, it's tough stuff. Forgiving as we've been forgiving, loving as we've been loving. Nick, that's not permission. Just, just tell me. Stay away. I've seen her with a gun. She knows how to. Of course not. Because here's the idea if Nick's perfected in his love, his love will stay true to the one he's committed to. And if we can understand that as humans, that to love someone means I'm not going to be an adulterer. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. I'm not going to cheat on you. I'm not going to abuse you. I'm not going to. I'm not going to be mean to you. I'm not going to hold grudges to you. I'm going to. I'm with you. Committed. That's what that idea is. Perfect love isn't defined by perfect performance. We're attached, as Wesley says, to these bodies of death. And these bodies are affected. I can tell you what. When Shelly, this morning, said, Honey, I don't want to go to the church when it's dark by myself. My flesh said, Sleep. <laughs> but my love said, Are you ready to go? Thank goodness you didn't come and see me in my pretty old t-shirt. My hair was the best. But perfect love does what's required to be one. And you see, sanctifying grace is this idea. God's done all the work. He's just asking you to commit to the relationship. I need all of you. He's got all of us. Provenient grace, he He's given himself fully to chasten us down. Saving grace, Jesus already died on the cross. Not just 2,000 years ago, Jesus wasn't the fix when the plan went wrong. Jesus was always the plan. Revelation called the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. God knew before he hovered over that water and gave form to this earth, he knew that his son would be to give up his life that we might know his grace. That's the kind of love God has given. That's how much of himself he's given to us. Provenient grace, saving grace, sanctifying grace is this moment when we finally say, Daddy, you got all of me. I mean, 100%. No doubt, no questions, no hesitation, no stepping back. Is that important? You better believe it is. Because folks, I got news, especially parents, and maybe that's just kind of on my mind this weekend. It isn't enough as a parent to say I'm a Christian. It isn't enough to take a trip to an all in prayer prayer, go about my life. Folks, we are forming the spiritual identity of our kids. Not by our actions and whether or not we go to church or read our Bible or say the right things. This relationship with our Heavenly Dad is informing the relationship of our children to their Heavenly Dad. It's an important thing. So And our kids and their kids the generations that follow deserve so much more than lip service and platitudes. I've said it before and I'm going to say it again. God isn't interested in your death. He's interested in your life. Because he longs to live it 
with you. Amen. One flame. One life. In the book of Deuteronomy, there's this thing called the Shema. And all the disciples and Jesus and all the people on the day of Pentecost knew the words of the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with how much? All. With how much? All. I, I'm not sure I can hear you. With how much? All. Of your heart. And with how much? All. Your soul. And with how much? All. That seems like that's a lot. It almost seems like he's asking for all of us. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, and when you walk along the road, and when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them with symbols on your hands, bind them to your forehead, write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. It's not enough to tell our kids how they ought to love Jesus. Amen. Not even a pastor gets past. And God gives them the choices to make. But God help me if I have not lived in front of my sons. Why? Because I know what's required. Because I know what's required of all of us. Who said, Father, I accept your grace. And the next step is, you can have all that I am. What happens? Well, in Exodus, we're here at the Ten Commandments, and in Exodus, God says, You shall not bow down to these other gods or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Punish them to the children for the sin of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand and a thousand and a thousand and forever those who love me. Keep my commandments. God's blessing on our lives probably has a lot to do with godly parents, grandparents, great grandparents, great 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 grandparents, and generations that have gone before us who've loved the Lord with all their heart, all their soul, all their strength. And now, what remains for the generations who follow us? Saw a lot of young lives in here yesterday as we said goodbye to 13 year old me. Not goodbye, but we said see you there. And my thought yesterday and today is what is my generation leaving for the generations who will follow me? Will they get an easy kind of grace that just says, say that prayer thing, go to that altar, do that thing, sit in church once in a while? Go to California, come home, and send some money, and come at least Christmas and Easter, and it'll be all right. God will show up on your death. Our children see parents who are married to Christ. He says, Word is right. Or they see parents in a marriage. I've asked the man to come and sing one song and prayer a blessing to us, to our generation for following us. And I'd ask you this morning, where are you at? Are you at? Do you take? Are you there? Maybe you've been there. The real question is, have you said yes? Yes, Daddy. Yes, Father. Yes, Spirit. You can have all of me. Because if you have it, they would be a really, really good chance to do that. To do it from your seat, to you come to this altar, to do it in prayer. But I've learned in my life when 
when I know there's something I need to take care of, the time to take care of it is because I've learned what I tell my wife, honey, I'm going to put a pin in that. Do you know how many pins there are in my life? Because the time to do things is when the day is here. Paul said today is the day of salvation. Why wait? Today is the day of the idea. Today is the day of, yes, you can have all of them. Let me pray for you and I want to close with this song. Do business and say yes. Father, thank you for this chance to be here together today. Thank you for your grace that has sought us, and your grace that has saved us. And even now, we give you thanks for your grace that consumes us, that forms us, that molds us into the very image of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. You said he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. May we hear today, and those who are listening to the sound of my voice, may we say, yes, I do. You have all that I am, all my love, all my heart, all my strength, all my soul. May we not hesitate, because we're being molded by something. May we choose to be molded by you, by and through your spirit, through his son, Jesus Christ. It's my prayer that you be with us as the followers of Christ, and that our hearts and that our lives would burn with such an incredible passion that no generation that walks behind us would miss the glowing residue of a life and lives that have been consumed by a passion, consumed by a love consumed by a calling to become one with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What a thought. The God that gave us life, that created us, that spoke into existence, the very world that we live on and the worlds that we see beyond us. That very same God said, be one with me. I will be one with you. May we not hesitate, no. May we just dive deep to the sanctifying grace that has called us, called us to be fully committed, fully consecrated, fully devoted to a life with you, not to change habits, not to, to change our minds, not to change anything, but just to be consumed by you and allow your spirit, your love, your life to change us from the inside out. We've been wretched in our commitment to follow you because we're in, we're out, we're up, we're down. But thanks be to God, there's now no condemnation because we've surrendered. We've said yes. We've given all that we are to you this day and every moment of our lives. Be with us on this journey. And when the end comes and we get to go home and be with you, that's just an icing on the cake. To a life lived with, to a life lived with peace, with hope, with joy, with love, in the midst of the darkest night, the most difficult circumstances, the hardest things we've ever faced. Our lives are not determined by our circumstances, but by the life that flows within us. We love you this day. We give you the praise. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. Christ is the Lord. God's people said, sing the words of the song with us as words.